Actually, I wanted to start my presentation uh, yep. about how we're winning, and then I'll speak about what's happening in Barcelona uh, in July. Um, so, as you guys might have heard from the from the previous presentation, I've been around for a while and been interacting with with Amir and other people uh, over the course of time. Um, and I have a little bit. I'm 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 from the optimist camp. Uh, and think that despite the challenges to Bitcoin that we're doing pretty good. And so I'd like to talk about that with you guys today. Um, the We Are Winning, Change My Mind uh, meme is, uh, you know, sort of like a tongue-in-cheek uh, provocation. Um, and I'm looking for this actually to be a dialogue. Uh, not necessarily ideological about this, but I think the, the things that I'm going to discuss... Um, further the type of dialogue that it is that, that Amir uh, mentioned in his talk. Um, so when I say who's winning, you know, who's we, I, I think that the cypherpunks are winning because um, we've, our, we've established ourselves uh, as a value system with implemented code. Um, Bitcoiners are winning because we're having ever more adoption and we can argue about, you know, what the quality of that adoption is. Uh, and shitcoiners, uh, and I, I use that term only because we're at a Bitcoin conference, but I don't particularly like it uh, myself. Uh, so we'll go on to this uh, point by point. So cypherpunks write code, and what's what's happened here is that is that cypherpunks have have become a role model, um, and this is you know expressed through public private key pair. Uh, cryptography and its implementations that we see in cryptocurrency. Um, cypherpunks have become essentially policymakers uh, in this sense. Um, so there's deployed code out there that, that is making governments and, and economists uh, react to what it is that we've done. Uh, and in the end, it's, it's still a revolutionary act. Um, we have Amir standing here in his Che Guevara cap um, espousing, you know, the revolutionary roots that, that come from Bitcoin. Uh, and that spirit is, is still there. It might be, you know, sort of uh, dieselified or commodified or brandified. Uh, but still, you know, Bitcoin represents, even in the public mind today, a, a revolution. Um, so Bitcoiners have become a lobby, essentially. We're moving governments to discuss policy. Uh, we're moving institutions, banks, uh, businesses to adapt, uh, and we're moving citizens across the planet. Um, it doesn't really matter which culture or which continent you come from. There are people who are discovering Bitcoin, uh, questioning it. They might come in through different areas than directly through Bitcoin. But essentially, you can look at us as a, as a, as a civilizational or a cultural lobby because we're part of the debate that's happening across the world about the state of the world and the state of the world's uh, financial system. <clears throat> Shitcoiners are innovators. So the type of uh, so ossification that, that Amir uh, is speaking to is part of the reason after the, after the scaling debate uh, that drove me out of, out of Bitcoin and into Ethereum, where there's a lot of young people, a lot of young energy and people that are moving fast and breaking things and experimenting in a lot of different areas, such as governance and uh, technology in terms of zero knowledge proofs, things like this, um, different types of scaling solution, and also with skin in the game economics. And so, you know, Bitcoiners tend to look at, you know, all of the shitcoinery that's going on and saying it's just a casino, it's just taking away breath and air out of the room from, from Bitcoin. And actually, I think that what's happening uh, in the shitcoin casino is actually a really great um, sort of like uh, distraction. So everything that's happening that the regulators are looking at just secures Bitcoin even more. We don't hear people talking about whether Bitcoin is legal or illegal, illegal anymore. They're all trying to adapt it into existing regimes. And that is happening partially because the focus is elsewhere where all of these games are happening and all this experimentation is happening on both Ethereum and on corporate chains, right up to the level of UST failing. So I think this all works in Bitcoin's favor. And then again, who else is winning is that everybody who wants trustless, 
permissionless, secure freedom to, to transact is winning. And so I'm going to go through eight points why it is that I think that's the case and where it is that I think that we're winning. And this is the place where it is that I'd like to challenge you guys to get involved with me. I'd like to invite people to come up who have a difference of opinion on any of the points that trigger. Or even if you want to agree with me, I, I, I don't really want to do a narrative or a dialogue, but I'd like to have some involvement. And even if it's on, in the spotlight, it would be great if some people take that invitation. So win number one is, in my eyes, cryptography. So open source audited cryptographic primitives provide the necessary foundation for a free society, enforceable property rights, and digital human rights. So this is not something that we, that we really had before. We had, we had the, the discussion around PGP, a very sort of like brutal thing to use. And right now what has happened is that Public, private, key pairs are pretty much the basis of how it is that we're either transacting financially or communicating with each other over, over secure messaging clients. So around the time that, that uh, so 2012, 2013, um, we had Keybase. And Keybase was a, was, a, was a key store, essentially, that allowed you to prove your, your social identity by linking it to uh, your different social media accounts or to your websites. Uh, and allowed for you sort of like a proof of existence. And what we have now is we have what people are calling Web3, which I find to be really funny. So Web3 used to mean the semantic web, but Web3 now has been sort of, is the catch-all phrase for everything that's happening in the browser with clients that are just using public-private key pair uh, tech. Yeah? And so this is where it is that we've actually separated identity from, from the ability to transact. We have a long way to go. But essentially, it's part of the, of the public dialogue and where a lot of, of, of technology development is happening. Win number two is public ledgers. So, I mean, we have a financial system that used to be predicated on, you know, double entry bookkeeping. Uh, and we still have the banks doing that and selling their ledgers with, a, you know, with each other every day. And what we've established is a concept of a distributed, decentralized public ledger, um, app and only database. Um, and we have, to varying degrees, distributed and decentralized networks um, that allow us to, to um, you know, lay the foundation for verifiable consensual record keeping. And... You know, so this sort of ability to, to whichever degree you agree with it or not, to, to be able to rewrite the past, whether that can be done in the future because of an economic attack or not, um, the idea of just successively burying the past as, an, as a set of archaeological layers uh, is, is, is really a big win for, for society. Number three, autonomous rule sets. So... Essentially, the anarchist perception is, uh, or position is to be free from coercion. And so we have a, we've established the idea or the ideal and a manifestation actually of non-coercive consensus rule sets. And this eliminates so much friction uh, uh, in human relationships because of the trustless nature and, machine, and between machine actors. So the type of experimentation that we're seeing happening uh, in Ethereum and on other chains that's not happening on Bitcoin, you know, is, is, is to bring us to the level where there is, you know, this sort of trustless interaction between machine actors. So I think that the ability to, to, to move as frictionlessly as possible between different types of consensus rule sets is a, is a win. Uh, and that's where it is that I differ from the Bitcoin maximalist, uh, um, you know, point of view that everything should be accruing to Bitcoin. Win number four is fungibility. One BTC is still one BTC. Does anybody question that? Anywhere. <laughs> Vlad, okay, cool. <laughs> we'll get to it then. We can argue about that. But one BTC also, what we've, the win that we have can also equal a ratio of any other representation of value that can be determined by markets. So as we have bit refill, you can get what it is that you want to get over bit refill. You can do anything that you want with Bitcoin, pretty much. And we've established the fact that it's a, it's a medium of exchange. It's a store of value. It fluctuates. But there's a, there's a win in terms of, of fungibility. Number five, the big win is legality. 
12 years from Satoshi's white paper to nation state acceptance. Amir spoke about like the first six months that he thought would take 10 years. I thought that this would take 30 years before we would have nation state acceptance. And so this is actually a much broader theme. What we're seeing right now is um, what I like to call the jurisdictional arbitrage phase where nation states and we have Zetas, a lot of, a lot of uh, Paralonipolis members have been involved in the South American uh, citadels and Zetas. Um, Elena Satoshi, um, an early member here, is now down in uh, working in Uruguay. Um, and, you know, we've seen Central, Afri Central African Republic, uh, most recent one. We have Samson Mao doing his work with, with Lugano in Switzerland and jetting around the world trying to get people to, uh, governments to accept uh, Bitcoin. And we've talked a lot about El Salvador in the last year, but it really was a game changer. And the reason why El Salvador was a game changer is not because it establishes lightning or not because it, you know, there was one rogue nation that came out and said, we're going to be, um, you know, using Bitcoin as a, as a national tender. The big win there is that El Salvador declaring Bitcoin as national tender has forced the city of London to change their Forex uh, rules. Because under international rules, when a nation state adopts something and declares something as a legal tender, it could be, it could be seashells. Then under international law, it has to be accepted. And so in the last six months, um, all of the legislation in the city of London has been, has been uh, adjusted to the fact that Bitcoin is now a, a, a recognized international uh, uh, tender. And the city of London is making the play to actually be the nexus of where it is that it interfaces with fiat and other systems. So we're not really, you know, there's challenges to the legality. You know, we have the custodial wallet issues. We have essentially Europe now speaking about how it is that they can integrate uh, crypto into the tax structure and whatever. And you can look at that from varying, you know, threat standpoints, but essentially Bitcoin uh, and, crypt and cryptocurrencies are becoming more and more in entrenched uh, and more and more legal. Number six, is the big win is decentralization. Uh, it's here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And when I say it's here, it means that we've established the technology uh, we've established uh, and defended the game theory of it. Um, so China banning Bitcoin just resulted in Bitcoin moving elsewhere. Um, I think it's a huge win that, that we see Bitcoin miners down in the conservative state of Texas using uh, containers to, you know, move around to do gas flaring. Um, you know, more and more countries, uh, more and more sta economic stakeholders are mining uh, Bitcoin. And, it, and the network is more decentralized than ever. Um, I think that the one sort of like threat is the chip makers, but I think that we're going to see different chip makers for ASICs, ASICs coming onto the market. Um, but the network is becoming more and more decentralized uh, year on year. Win number seven is the energy debate. So I think that, I think that the, the two competing models right now, proof of work and proof of stake algorithms, um, Whichever way it is that it plays out, um, we've, you know, we've, we've been arguing about the energy mix, right? Um, Bitcoin uh, and or sort of proof, of, proof of work and proof of stake mining operations have the highest percentage of renewable uh, energy in their mix compared to any other industry. And this is, this is actually because of the location independent nature of, of mining to be able to move to the, to the, you know, where the energy is cheapest. What we're seeing is more investment coming along with sustainable mining. Um, and with proof of stake, we, I mean, we can argue about, about, you know, the two systems, the two algorithms, which one is more efficient or not, but they're definitely going to become, you know, more and more part of our future. But the argument around them, um, allows us to have discussions about energy usage in the future. And so essentially what I see happening is, is the end of the stored energy paradigm, the petrodollar, and us moving towards, um, you know, real-time energy metering. And when I speak about real-time energy metering, um, 
underpinning so the calculations for an economic system is I do believe on the utopian side that we will keep um, increasing our technological um, sophistication to be able to um, more and more use real-time energy that's coming from the sun, the wind, and the waves. And if you, if you look at it from a thermodynamics perspective, when we reach sort of you know, a parity for our general use rather than moving heavy objects through the air or across the sea or things like that, that we can have, we can have an economic, economic system and economic projections based on the energy that's being used that's coming, you know, that's being generated from the planet at any given moment. And, you know, it's not like it's something that's going to happen in one, three, five years, but, you know, this might be something that's moving towards, you know, 30, 50 year sort of timelines. But, the energy debate is our footprint in determining how it is that we're going to be determining uh, economic value in the future. So I think it's a big win. And number eight is the name of this, of this organization, uh, Parallel Nepolis, Parallel Societies. So I think that these three groups together, cypherpunks, bitcoiners, shitcoiners, uh, that we've succeeded in establishing circular economies of value, reputation, and consensus modeling that are actually competing with nation states for membership. And membership doesn't necessarily mean that you're a card-carrying member, but it means that maybe that you're an ideological uh, member. And I was born in 1963, and, and now over the course of my life, uh, in the last 10 years, involved in, you know, really people that are much, much younger than I am in their 30s, in their 20s. I mean, Mario, I don't know, I think Mario's, you know, 25 or 26 years old. Incredibly smart young guy that's invested in this technology. There's so many people out there. And I look at, you know, the future and I think, you know, what are things going to be like in 10, 20, 30 years from now when my generation, the, boom, the boomers die out, when this this last century paradigm of, of the Cold War and mutually assured destruction and, and this just inner, this, this incestuous economic and politically interlocked clusterfuck when we're out of the way and the people that are growing up with these standards and these technologies that the cypherpunks have been able to postulate and, and to a certain degree manifest, what are the potential things going to be? And that's why it is that I'm not really cynical. Um, and I'm, and I don't have any sort of anger because I see the potential and I would prefer to believe in the human spirit. And that's what, you know, motivated me about Bitcoin when the light went off for me with WikiLeaks, when WikiLeaks was blockaded by, by, by PayPal. And all of a sudden, you know, there was like really a use case to actually collect money to perpetuate the work that WikiLeaks was doing. And so what I see happening around me is more and more locations um, uh, and more and more groups of people that are establishing parallel systems of, of transacting. And there's not so much of this happening in the Bitcoin space when we want to talk about cryptocurrencies. You know, there's the idea of citadels and now we have the idea of Bitcoin City. Um, but there's not really sort of like really organizational and governance models. It's sort of like a free-for-all. And we're seeing that sort of experimentation happening uh, in the Ethereum space. We see it with different consensus rule sets like, like Polkadot, um, also carbon neutral chain like Avalanche. Um, there's just so many competing models. And I think that it's a win for all of us to watch these things, you know, sort of like shake out. And the early Bitcoiner point of view has always been that anything that can be done on another chain can be done on Bitcoin. And... That can't actually happen if we have the ossification that Amir is talking about, the lack of desire to actually look at our brothers who are working on other chains or are working on other projects and our, and our sisters that are, you know, also striving for a sense of freedom. And I know that there's people from, from the Ethereum community in this room um, that represent, you know, really strong cypherpunk values. And what it is that I'd like to see or how it is that I'd like to see my position uh, in our community um, is, 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 is a bridge builder. Like, I'm interested in anybody who wants to improve the world, um, you know, for, for other people. And I'm interested in seeing the experimentation. I'm interested in seeing the, the intellectual honesty to engage with each other about where it is that we can possibly go. 
And so in closing, um, before it is that I open it up for you guys to either challenge me or, or agree with me, um, I'd like to point out that I think that um, we're in an incredibly traumatized time. The pandemic was, was really just the first step uh, along a long path of the next 10, 20, 30 years that are going to get successively harder. And people are so easily triggered. We are, it's like, I mean, you're standing in a market and somebody thinks that you pushed ahead of the line in front of them. They, they literally go f as ballistic as somebody on Twitter. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a zeitgeist. It's not just crypto Twitter. It's not just online. It's actually in your everyday life that everybody is really, really, really on edge. And so my invitation uh, to everybody in the room is to have empathy. Recognize that the people that you have a difference of opinion with are also human beings. And just because that they have a difference of opinion or a different rule set that they want to manifest with a shit coin or an altcoin or a different implementation of Bitcoin, remember this is all about people. Bitcoin, Ethereum, monetary systems, governance systems are social consensus there's social communities. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shared idea about how what money is, what value it is, and how it is that we transact with each other. But at the end of the day, it's about people. It's about discussion. It's about us reaching out to each other and trying to understand each other. Um, so that's what this house is about. I'm really excited to see you know, the different trajectory that, it, that, it's, that Parallel Nepolis is taking by separating out different types of cryptocurrency events, that ETH Prague is going to be happening here, um, that HCPP will go, be going back to, the, to the, uh, you know, the hacker roots, which is more about experimentation, more about you know, challenging ideas and things, and not so narrowly focused on only the Bitcoin narrative. So if you want to change my mind about these things, um, I've got a microphone here, and you can come up here and challenge me, Vlad, on something. You want to talk about yes. Sure. Great. Right, so let's take it from one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. <laughs> like, I can have one Bitcoin, and I can send it to... Who do I recognize? Sergey from BitRefill. But you can have one I Bitcoin. Him. I don't trust him, man. Don't send it to him. Okay. Maybe I want to get gift cards. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I send you one Bitcoin and you get that one Bitcoin to the exchange that banned me and you're also going to get banned. So how does that even work? If It's not really fungible if it has different origins and you, you can discriminate. What type of banning are you talking? So you were talking about the colored coin, coin argument. That essentially that you can that you can you know say this Bitcoin is good Bitcoin and this Bitcoin is bad Bitcoin is is what you're saying. Does that really exist right now? Well, there is discrimination between coin joint Bitcoins and the ones that come from exchanges. Discrimination by who? Mostly, so there are not miners that reject your transactions. At least not that I'm aware of. The last time this happened, there was Maripool, but I think they still discriminate. They just announced that they're not, but I heard that is, they still Is are. Maripool the only provider? No, I, I understand where you're going with this, but there are these regulated entities okay. that are basically middlemen that help you bridge between the free market, which is Bitcoin, and the centralized, you know, the regulated central bank controlled market. They're still on and off ramps uh, that are that are with regulated entities that allow for non KYC uh, uh, on and off ramps of fiat up to one thousand euros in Europe. Yeah, but we're talking about one BTC equals one BTC, not how we can make one BTC to be equal on BTC. It's about finding generality as opposed to the exception to what generally happens when you get your bitcoins dirty. Well, also I Ethereum. don't see. So, I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't see that as being. I don't see that as 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 being a policy anywhere. I see it as being potentially a threat. But as long as there's an alternative where you can do one BTC for one BTC, you know, 
if you want to clean your Bitcoin, actually the fastest way right now is to use the POW peg on our BTC with the RSK network and go, go one direction in and one direction out and it's like the cleanest mix that you, that you can possibly have even if you have a coin joined Bitcoin. Also lightning channels, also there's that trick with the Electrum wallet, there's the one with, what's it called? Oh, damn, he's gonna hate me. It's created by Nicholas Gregory Mercury. So yeah, that, that's also well, very interesting. So my, essentially my argument is, is that there's always gonna be an alternative. There's always going to be a way around any censorship that is tried to, you know, that's to be imposed on it. Even if we, even if we go down like this, the CBDC route, right, freedom money and, and, and surveillance money, there will be a peg somewhere in some jurisdiction with some, you know, uh, perpetual swap that's available on decentralized markets. Um, you know, we do have unstoppable domains. We do have HNS. We do have, you know, plenty of ways to be, uh, you know, getting around any type of DNS stuff. We have decentralized storage that is happening. Um, it's just that Bitcoiners are not really excited about or wanting to use those things because they're associated with shit coins. But the technology is out there to, to bridge your assets, um, you know, any way that you want. It has a cost, right? So, I mean, right? It's yeah, okay, we can agree that we can be optimistic about this financial layer that in the future it's going to get better and there's going to be the right technology for it. But at the same time, there is discrimination which is embedded into the Bitcoin code because every node has a blacklist. It was supposed to be renamed blacklist at some point. But you can discriminate addresses from receiving or from you know, interacting with your node. You can ban IP addresses. Miners can choose not to include certain types of transactions into their blocks, and it's at their own expense because they're not collecting the fees. But what I'm trying to say is that Bitcoin is fundamentally designed to not really be a fungible currency because there's always this option to not pick up one type of transaction from one type of party. But is it actually happening? No, because it's not happening in the case of miners for financial incentives, in the case of nodes, because we are culturally developing this custom of not censoring and not blacklisting. But we can do that, and that's where I'm getting, because if you want one BTC to not be one BTC, you have all the instruments in the design of the system to make it not be. Okay. Like, there are developers in the room, I guess, they can argue against me. It's, it's, not that I don't, it's not that I agree or disagree with you. It's that I want to have that dialogue, okay? Like, so it's, I it's, really want it to be fungible, and there are ways in which it can become fungible temporarily. Like, if you mix it with, you know, coin joints, like the entire supply, it's fungible. If you get it all on exchanges, even if it's not ideal, it becomes fun fungible afterwards, even if it's going to get tracked like hell. If you get it off exchanges, that also makes it a lot more fungible. But in this hybrid model where you have coins all over the place, you're going to have different types of markets where you have access or where you don't have access, depending on what kind of coins you have and what you're trying to do with them. And ideally, there should be some sort of bridge to connect them. I think that, you know, I'm being a shill right here, but I like what they're doing with the coin joins. And I, I think that culturally, if we, more of us do coin joins, it's going to be harder for them to reject them. As well, zero knowledge, zero knowledge tech, you know, allows us to go in that direction without actually, you know, I mean, they're so on the Ethereum side, they're talking about the ZK EVM now, not just, not just uh, roll ups, uh, also talking about ZK Wasm, so WebAssembly language. You know, in three to five years from now, everything's going to be like Amir says. I mean, Amir, what Amir's working on is amazing in DarkFi, um, you know. There's not going to be a way to actually color things anymore or censor those things. We're not there yet, but um, it's definitely coming. Yeah, I think. I did hear a commentary from Andrew Polstra from Blockstream in which he said that he can basically put the entire Bitcoin blockchain into a ZK rollup, and that's going to fix the scalability and initial block download issue. But that's still unpopular in Bitcoin, and it's never going to happen, most likely. And it's not just that. 
the developers are not interested in doing it. It's just that there's so much money involved that a lot of people are afraid of any kind of change. So it's only as more money until person, they're not until uh, somebody uh, until somebody comes up with a fork that people agree with because they're tired of it. Yeah, it's gonna be very hard for it to get traction. That's what my concern is. It might be ideologically and technically so, correct. So how do you so how do you feel about the lack of, of 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 clients for Bitcoin? That Bitcoin Core is the is the primary client, and that we you know I mean I think there's what Jared eight clients on yeah yeah. I mean, I'm there's still limp Bitcoin. Clients. It's still being maintained, even if Amir is not working on it. There's still, I guess, the one by Luke Dash Junior is like a fork of Bitcoin Core, so it doesn't really count. But yeah, there was always this, I think the origin of this fear dates back to that accidental hard fork when they had that database Berkeley DB update. It was my current fault. It's why Bitcoin doesn't have 100% uptime. And I guess it was somewhere around that time that they decided it's better to focus on only one implementation. Historically, well, actually, that's when, when actually when when Gavin turned over um, uh, the the core maintenance to Corey Wells, I think um, when he left the Bitcoin Foundation, the first thing that he was doing was working on an alternative implementation. So it wasn't that there was resistance. It's just sort of like. You know what became Bitcoin Core is has coalesced around what what seems to be a functioning, uh, you know, developer group for them, yeah. But it doesn't really allow for. Uh, there is not doesn't seem to be a willingness uh, of, uh, on the miner side or on the you know people who run Node side to be trusting something other than 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 Core. Seems to me. It's also m more convenient and e easier to maintain and verify. So I can understand this point of view that they want something to be very simple and predictable and easy to read through, as opposed to having something very complex that can fail in different points. So uh, I very much understand this base layer argument. I'm pretty sure that stuff that gets built on top of it, like second layers, what gets built on Lightning, that's going to be groundbreaking. Even though I'm not sure I'm happy with the decentralization side of Lightning, even though I run a node at home and I know a lot of people who do, you know, the liquidity operators are usually big companies. There's Bitfinex, there's Ellen Big, there's BitRefill right there. <laughs> You're one of well, the Lightning biggest. has a liquidity, it has, you know, liquidity issues and it has costs. I mean, this is what, what happened in the Ethereum side is how do you onboard users when you need the token for the network to pay for your transactions, right? How do you onboard users on the Lightning when you need to have liquidity to establish your channel to, you know, to participate in the network? It doesn't mean that things are going to stay that way, I think. Oh, no. You know? But there is still a lot of need for involvement. There is still a lot of need for education. Because a lot of people are still stuck in the mentality of downloading the app from the App Store. And they think that's it. And that's why for a while, I guess, until education started to take off, a lot of people were using SPV wallets. And I suppose a lot of the experience nowadays is SPV. Even though I think some very interesting and smart workarounds have been made, like Breeze Wallet, which I think has the most brilliant design, as it, it's non-custodial. Dude, man, I mean, come on, how are we not winning? Look at all we the alternatives, winning, but right? We started from the <laughs> fungibility argument, which is very difficult and it's very easy for one BTC to not be equal to another one. That's where I was getting. There's always this, there are means hard-coded in Bitcoin that help you discriminate. So if you want to discriminate, even if it's in bad faith and the community is going to hate you, and even if you fail to collect a fee, you can do it. Okay. Good point. I, I don't think there's a solution to that. It might be a future feature of sorts, maybe. I don't know. But it's still not like gold, you know? In the case of gold, you take a gold bar, you melt it, and you put it in a different shape. And there is no previous history of its former life. You don't know what it well, used I'm, to Well, I'm be. arguing that you can do that with, with, uh, with uh, the peg on RBTC at this point. 
you can you can transmute your digital gold into RBTC and back to and back to BTC with no with no previous history. Essentially, mm, I can't argue against that because I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> oh, why don't you try it? That'd be cool. I should. Yeah. Anybody else want to pick up a point from from one of the one of the the wins that it is that I believe that we have and challenge that or. Come on, you guys. You can't all be in, ag in agreement with me on all of these points. Governance. How are we doing on governance? What do you guys see as governance? Are we winning in the area of governance? On Bitcoin or in crypto? Come on. You guys chicken? Is it the spotlight? Am I boring? This is a really hard crowd, man. Come on down. Well, it seems to me that there's more Bitcoin wallets and a much more distributed, uh, actually much more distributed holding uh, across stakeholder groups and sizes than there ever has been. So we have large holders like MicroStrategy, we have institutional investors, but it looks to me like the, the actually there's more distribution of Bitcoin than there ever has been. What do you... I have, I've never really understood the incentive that people believe that a large holder would want to do something that kills the network that provides the value to the asset that it is that they're holding. There seems to be just like a, you know, a real disconnect between believing that the interest of small holders is different than the interests of large holders or whales. I haven't seen a conducive argument for why it is that they would want to do something that decreases the value of their, of their asset. centralized uh, central finance you want to say that again the whole sentence you have a microphone now right I have a microphone but... okay cool okay so um, what's to say that the um, institutions the larger institutions actually don't own these smaller wallets so it's actually more a case of we don't see large um, wallet holders anymore or as many new large uh, wallet holders because the plan for the larger institutions actually to manipulate the market uh, with, with these um, by, by selling off from the smaller wallets. So what's wrong with market manipulation? Well, the, would the idea not be for these... Um, Where is there in the Bitcoin rule set a prevention of market manipulation of the price and the value of the asset? Where is that written into the code base? That's a human behavior. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin. So my idea is, is that what fungibility means, and I started with the one BTC equals one BTC thing, what fungibility means for me is that anybody gets to use it. When two weeks ago when I was in Barcelona with, with Amir, um, he was, or maybe it was three weeks ago, he was on a full-on rant about Tony Blair and Bill Clinton meeting down in, in the Bahamas, right? He's a war criminal and these motherfuckers and I agree with him. But fungibility means for me that war criminals and pedophiles and any other type of criminal, whether it's a nation state or an individual, gets to do what it is that they want to do with Bitcoin. And when they can do what they want to do with Bitcoin, it means the guy in El Salvador can us here at Parallelipolis, that's what fungibility means for me. There is no rules on who can or can't use it or for why. And if large holders hold it and manipulate the market on its volatility, I don't, how does that harm Bitcoin 
it may harm your expectation for what you think Bitcoin should be uh, uh, valued by. But there are alternatives where it is that you can spread your spread your um, your risk portfolio. So I just don't really believe that it's a zero sum game. I don't. Know, I, I just don't believe in hyper Bitcoinization. Is Bitcoin is the thing is the black hole that's going to suck all the value into the world, and we're going to provide some sort of technology where it is that the only thing that's happening is going to be Bitcoin. And I'll tell you why I don't like that idea, and I'll tell you why I don't like Bitcoin maximalism. I find it to be incredibly statist. I find it to be incredibly arrogant to say, we have to protect people from using that shit coin. We have to protect people from not losing their money. Explain to me how that's different from the dollar hegemony. Explain to me how that's different from any government on the planet right now. We exist to protect you from yourself. I'm sick and fucking tired about being protected from myself. Freedom to me means the freedom to fail. And if I want to lose my money by putting it in a speculative casino, who the fuck is a Bitcoiner to tell me not to do it because they care about me and their moral ethical position? Fuck that. It's a status view. Think about it for a moment. Who the fuck are Bitcoiners to tell people how to use their Bitcoin or what cryptocurrency it is that they should be using? Doesn't it sound to you like the governments that you fucking hate? Sure does to me. Fungibility means anybody who gets to do with it whatever it is that they want to do. And if they want to manipulate the market with it because they have more than it, of it than you do, life ain't fair. Bitcoin fixes fucking nothing. I hate that meme. Bitcoin fixes this. Bitcoin fixes that. It doesn't fix anything. Where it is that I'm in total alignment with Amir and other people is that we need a paradigm shift. We need a paradigm shift about what it is that it means to be a human being and how it is that we interact with each other. There is no technological solution to social problems. We might be able to, you know, adjust things in a better way and make it a little bit more fear here and there, but trustless transaction only goes so far. We need to readjust who it is that we are and how it is that we treat each other. Whether it's because of gender or nationality or belief or whatever, when are we going to get to the point that we recognize that we are genetically 99.99% similar with each other? When are we going to stop killing each other because we got different skin color or because we put our dick in the wrong place. I mean, right? Isn't that what it's all about? We can get lost in the economics and the technical aspects of Bitcoin, but what is it that we need on the planet? We need to treat each other with respect and care, and we need to pull together and pull on the same, and pull on the same string and fucking survive, man. That's what the pandemic's about. It's a wake-up call. The planet's sick. We're all sick. We're traumatized. We're fighting with each other. Why? Century on century, the same shit. And Bitcoin's supposed to fix that? I don't believe it. There's other things that we need to do to fix who we are and what we are on the planet. There's my rant. <laughs> My idealistic grant. So here's the shilling point. Um, July 5th in Barcelona, uh, together with a, a group of, of local crypto anarchists, uh, we're going to be opening Parallel Nipolis in Barcelona. It's called Polis Paralela. And we're going to be opening it with an uh, exponential unconference uh, with four roundtable tracks. Uh, which are zero knowledge, governance, um, wow, I forgot the other two, um, protocols, uh, and security. And we have an amazing space. Um, this is the, uh, the top floor. So we have 800 square meters, 400 meters on the top floor and 400 meters on the bottom floor, and an internal courtyard that's very similar to what it is that we have here. 
I'd really like to show more pictures and videos of the space, but it's architecturally uh, stunning. Uh, and so as of July 5th, uh, Mario and myself and a bunch of other people from Barcelona are making the next chapter of Parallel Society in, in Barcelona. Uh, you're invited to come down and join us. Get in touch with me uh, if you'd like to come and join us for this, for this opening event. And hodl, don't forget to hodl. Thank <laughs> you.